So much media. So little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and American League Baseball, capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. This is my third year of being the ringmaster of the Mr. Media Radio Show, and I'm starting to see previous guests return with new projects. And that is certainly the case tonight, and I'm very excited about this, as cartoonist and art historian Trina Robbins returns to the show to talk about her new project, The Brinkley Girls. Trina was a great guest the first time around, talking about her original comic book character, Go Girl, and many other things. This time, however, she's here to talk about and promote a new Fantagraphics collection of full-color art by Nell Brinkley, drawn between 1913 and 1940. It's a beautiful coffee table book uh, laden with history and significance for both comics and uh, print and advertising, at least the style, I think. Uh, Trina, welcome. Welcome back to Mr. Media. Having me. It's good to talk to you again. It's good to talk to you. I uh, we had a good time the last time. Subject was a little different. <laughs> um, I, Trina, I think many people will feel like Nell Brinkley's art is very familiar, uh, even if they, they can't quite make the connection to her name. Why is that? Well, I guess it's the style, really, you know. Um, she, actually, it's really interesting about Nell because she changed with the times, and her earliest style is very Art Nouveau, and people will recognize the Art Nouveau style, people who love Art Nouveau. And then in the 20s, her style became very Art Deco. Again, it changed with the times, and people will recognize that style. I mean, these are styles that people know, connoisseurs anyway, people who know their art, people who know old art. They're going to see this, and they're going to love it. And also, there's just an instant recognition of the beautiful women she drew. I mean, it's just, you just connect. You connect to these gorgeous, the Brinkley girls is what they were called. Now, I have to ask you, before we go any further, I, I've had my nose in this book uh, a good while today, and uh, I'm just looking at picture of you. Uh, your hair looks, I mean, you look like a Brinkley girl. I know. I know. We both <laughs> had that curly hair, didn't we? Now we yeah. have that kind of hair, too, yeah. Is it, I mean, you've had the benefit of... Uh, you know, knowing that there was a Nell and, and that she'd been around. And, I mean, is your look uh, at all uh, connected to her that way? I never way? tried to look like a Brinkley girl on purpose, but I did notice that Nell and I had similar hair, and the women she drew with all that curly hair, yeah. But I didn't <laughs> do it on purpose. I mean, I was born with curly hair, and let me tell you, in the 60s, when straight hair was all the thing, I used to hate my hair. I ironed my hair in the 60s. <laughs> you but know, my hair has forgiven me. People who have, have, have met me in the last 25 years will find this hard to believe, but in the 60s and 70s, I had a full head of curly hair, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh-huh. My, mo my mother tried for years to find some barber shop or something <laughs> where they could straighten out my, my, my hair. And uh, it's uh, the last month or so, I've, for the first time in years, I've actually been letting it grow out, and it's got this, it's all wavy and curly again. It's a... Uh, not mm -hmm. to get off the topic, but uh, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, no, about curly your, hair. your hair forgives you, and it goes back to being curly no matter what you do to it. <laughs> um, so t t t tell me, first of all, about the book's dedication. You, you, you dedicated this book, which you edited, uh, to three uh, particular women. What, what's that all about? Well, she was, Nell Brinkley was an enormous inspiration um, to, to young girls at the time, as, as some of whom grew up to become cartoonists themselves. And the three women that I dedicated it to, um, Dale Messick, who created Brenda Starr, mm -hmm. Hilda Terry, who did a strip called Tina, and Marty Lynx, who did a strip called Bobby Socks. And I'm, I'm so very sorry that within about the past five years, all three of them have passed away. But when mm -hmm. they, they all have told me when I interviewed them, that when they were girls, what they loved was Nell Brinkley and how they used to save her strips, you know, and lots of little girls, young women, teenage girls, used to save her strips, paste them in, in scrapbooks. Sometimes the really younger ones would even color them in, and they would copy them. 
And the one, of course, who was the most influenced by Nell Brinkley was Dale Messick. If you look mm. at her early... Uh, oh, Brenda, Brenda Starr, Stars, sure. Yeah, they have that same... You can see she just loved that whole fluffy, that ruffled look and paid a lot of attention to the hair and the clothes. You know, she was she was probably the one who was the most influenced by Nell Brinkley. Mm. Um, did did uh, did Nell Brinkley uh, uh, impact your? I mean, and you know, you wear a number of hats. Uh, of course, uh, cartoonist and historian. Uh, did she influence your style as well? I, I I discovered her too late to be influenced by her. Okay. Um, but you know, it was an automatic when I saw her work. Again, as I say, I just immediately connected to it. I think that you just connect to this gorgeous art. Mm. Do you do you wish? It, I mean, do you wish that you had been affected uh, uh, earlier, impacted? Um, do you think you would have changed? No, because you know I've always loved the beautiful. I've always loved pretty. Um, which so did Nell Brinkley. I don't mm-hmm. think that it would have changed anything. Okay. And um, how much and in what ways do you relate to Nell's story and uh, her career? Well, you know what? Oh, oh, her career, I mean, she really started young. She was actually at the age of 17, um, maybe a little too young. She was drawing for the Denver Post, and, and at that point she wasn't really quite good, good enough. <laughs> and uh, she got the nickname at, at the, the Denver Post. They, they called her Little Smero. <laughs> She must have done a lot of erasing. But then she went back to art school for a couple of years and went back back to the Denver Post. And at this point, she was discovered by Arthur Brisbane, who was an editor for the Hearst Syndicate. And he brought her to New York in 1907 to work for the Hearst Syndicate. And she was nationally syndicated. And they put her to work basically doing what she did best, which is draw beautiful women. Mm-hmm. Um the interesting thing about her, of course, is that she was also an early feminist. You know, you can see this in her work. Okay, a lot of the work is just pretty girls. She loved drawing pretty girls, and she was incredibly good at it. And at the clothes, you know, she was fabulous at the fashions of the time. But she was this early feminist also. And the the first serials she did, she did these, they were like serialized in the Sunday papers, they were full color, gorgeous, full color pages that told stories, and they were very much like the silent movie serials of the day. You know, in the 1920s, you'd go to the movies, the kids would go to like an afternoon movie, and there would be this exciting serial. It would be serialized, you know, from, from week to week. And, and her strips, they weren't really strips yet, they were just full page stories, were very mm-hmm. much like this. They were very exciting, and the protagonist of this, these stories were always women. And they were these, of course they were gorgeous, but they were also these strong, feisty women. Like the very first one she did, the first serial she did, is called Golden Eyes and her hero, Bill. And Bill, Bill, it, this took place, it started in 1918 when the United States had joined the First World War. And Bill, of course, goes overseas to fight, and Golden Eyes, who is the gorgeous heroine, oh, and he gives her his collie when he leaves. His collie mm-hmm. is named Uncle Sam, and this is, of course, one of these brilliant dogs. This is like a precursor to Lassie. This is really smart dog. And they, Golden Eyes and Lassie, Golden Eyes and, and Uncle Sam, excuse me, go off to Europe, too, because her boyfriend is gone, and she joins the Red Cross. She becomes an ambulance driver for the Red Cross. And, I mean, this is a whole long serial. Her ambulance crashes in the forest one day, and she's captured by this this German um, commander, this lieutenant or something, and he puts the bake on her naturally, and there she is, you know, with her her little great, you know, uniform, her Red Cross uniform ripped, you know, fetchingly ripped, and she kind of vamps him to get, like, the secret information 
and she she ties the information to her dog, to this great dog, and sends him off to find Bill and to pass on the secret information. And when the the uh, the German finds out he's about to shoot her, and Bill shows up at the last minute and rescues her. It's an incredible story, and it goes on. It goes on. She and and the collie Uncle Sam over here. They're in no man's land, and they overhear the Germans planning to attack Bill's battalion. And she and the dog run off to warn the battalion, and they get there too late, and there's been a battle, and she finds her boyfriend wounded on the field of battle, and she drags him to safety. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing feminist story from 1918. Now, you know, a lot of times uh, we read uh, these days, we'll read about uh, someone like Nell, uh, and then we'll find, uh, and then at the end or somewhere in the middle, it'll indicate that she was... Uh, lesbian or you know something along that line. So that, that that's not the case here. Sorry, no. She was she was married once and divorced and had a son. And mm-hmm. as far as I know, um, you know, you can believe me. You can be a straight woman and appreciate gorgeous women <laughs> and draw gorgeous <laughs> women because I do. I understand, but it, it, you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's not unusual. It, sometimes you hear that. And sometimes it's a little bit of rewriting, and it's a lot of, you know, maybe something is implied. Oh, there's a lot taken. of rewriting, you know. People like to say that anyone famous really was of their persuasion, if you know mm. what I mean. Yep, yep. It, it, I've it's heard like that. It makes you feel maybe more secure to think that this, this person was of your persuasion. Now, was she recognized? Uh, uh, was her talent recognized in her in her in her day? Did, Nell you know? was a superstar. She mm. was a family name, a household name. Um, not only did like people, especially people of the female persuasion, cut out and save her her drawings and paste them, like I say, in scrapbooks, and sometimes color them in if they were very young. But have you heard of the Ziegfeld Follies? Most people sure. Yeah, okay. So the, the Ziegfeld Follies was this, this um, it was a variety show, really. And part of the variety show, starting in 1908, and mm-hmm. the years after that, part of the variety show was based on Nell Brinkley. They, they would call it the Brinkley Girls. And they would dress these chorus girls up in white outfits, and this was before she did color. She did a lot of black and white stuff before she did color. Remember, she started in 1907, and her first color work was 1918. Okay, they would take these beautiful chorus girls, dress them up in white, and would put white makeup on them, and then they would outline them in black so that they would look like living drawings. And they would, they would actually do like tableaus where they looked like famous Nell Brinkley drawings. And this, by the way, shows you how incredibly famous her work was that you could recognize, you know, you could recognize the drawing and you knew, you not only knew it was by a a Nell Brinkley drawing, but you knew which drawing it was because you knew Hmm. her stuff. And there were three, there might have even been more, but I I have found three songs written about her, the Brinkley Girl and the Brinkley Bathing Girl, and another one, which I'm not going to repeat because it was kind of mildly racist, but in those <laughs> days they didn't know they were being racist. Of course you understand that. Mm-hmm. And so uh, her connection to the Ziegfeld Follies was probably what made her more widely known. I yes? think she was already widely known, and that's why they put her in the Follies. Hmm. It was the other way around. It was oh, because okay. she was so famous that they put her in the Follies. Huh. Um, let's talk about the hair. We start. Well, I mentioned about the hair because your hair reminded me of her characters. Mm-hmm. But how important was the hair? And and did women, you know, outside of New York, copy that hair, or did they see the it? Or was it hair. mostly New York thing? <laughs> the Brinkley yeah. hair was so important that you could actually buy products. Nell Brinkley hair wavers, Nell Brinkley bob curlers, um, and I think another one, Nell Brinkley hair curlers. Uh, Three different uh, products that sold for 10 cents a card, and in fact, the the art on the card and the art in the ads was drawn by Nell Brinkley. I mean, you could buy this product to make your hair look like the Nell Brinkley girls. And, you know, Nell Brinkley hair curlers, 
Can you imagine? She sold products. <laughs> I'm sorry. Trina, are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the line went dead for a second. Okay, oh, no. good. Did you hear me good, say, good, good. say that, that she sold yeah, they, products? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, her, uh, who are some of her contemporaries in terms of you know, being artists? And, and uh, I mean, did anyone have the kind of following that she did well, among you women? Know, this is very interesting because one of her contemporaries, he was a little earlier, but they were contemporary also, and that's Charles Dana Gibson. And the Gibson girls, of course, were incredibly famous. And when Nell Brinkley came along, um, the popular belief was that the Brinkley girls had superseded the, um, the, the Gibson girls. And it's mm. interesting because the Gibson girls are very different. The Gibson girls, you know, even though, well, they kind of span the century. You know, he started in the 19th century and went on to the early 20th through the 20s, really. But his women, the, Brink, the Gibson girls, even though they're very pretty, of course, they're beautiful, but they're very, they're like serene, and they're very, they don't move a whole lot. They kind of sit and they pose prettily, you know. They don't do a lot. And her girls, it's like they're pure 20th century. They laugh with their mouths open, you know. The Gibson girls have like Mona Lisa smiles, you know, very modest. The, the Brinkley girls laugh with their mouths open and they run and they jump and they play. They even surf, you know. They're <laughs> active. They're the 20th century girl. So they really superseded the Gibson girls. But, of course, what's really interesting is everybody knows the Gibson girls. You say Gibson girls, most people understand. Uh, you can actually look in the dictionary and you can find Gibson girls. But you look in the dictionary, you do not find Brinkley girls. And mm. it's just very hard for me not to think, well, gee whiz, he was a guy and she was a girl, and could there be some reason there that he's remembered and she isn't? Mm, what do you think? <laughs> I think that it's because he was a guy and she was a girl. And I think that men, up until very recently, have written the history, and they've written the art history. I mean, we all, re well, we don't all, because not all of us are old enough, but when I went to college and I took art, there was this art book that everybody got in college, The History of Art, and there wasn't one woman artist in this book. I mean, that's classic. It's changed since then, thank God. But that's what things were like, because men had written the history. And, of course, this is what I try to change with my books, with a book like, like this about Nell, because she was so incredibly famous, and now she's forgotten, except now she's not forgotten because of this book. And how did you discover her? I owe a lot to Bill Blackbeard. Bill Blackbeard uh, had something in San Francisco called the San Francisco Academy of Comic Art. He has since retired and living in Santa Cruz. But the San Francisco Academy of Comic Art consisted of a huge two-story house and basement filled from floor to ceiling with comics. Newspaper comics, mostly. This is what he specialized in. And you could do research at the San Francisco Academy of Comic Art. You had to call and you had to make an appointment, and you could not smoke in that building, let me tell oh, you. Sure. <laughs> now, if Bill liked you, he would be much more helpful than if he didn't like you. And I was <laughs> very lucky because Bill liked me. And in mm -hmm. 1970, before I knew anything about Neil Brinkley, he gave me a couple of pages. He had a couple of extra Neil Brinkley pages, and they were gorgeous. I didn't know anything about her. I just knew that her art was gorgeous. And that was all that most people knew about her. Then we have to fast forward to the 1990s. And a friend of mine, and at this point, of course, I'm wired and I have email. A friend of mine forwarded this email to me. And the interesting thing is I've asked her since, and she says she absolutely doesn't remember forwarding it to me, and she doesn't remember where in the world it came from. Quite amazing. But this email, now, I had already written a book on women cartoonists, and I had included Nell Brinkley, but I didn't really know anything about her. I had received a little bit of information from her about her from some group in Southern California who were art fans of illustrators, and it later turned out that most of this information was absolutely incorrect. Okay, so it's the 90s, and my friend forwards this information, and this information says, 
my mother was a lifelong fan of Nell Brinkley's and collected all her work. And my mother has passed away and left me all of Nell Brinkley's work. I would like to pass this on to someone who knows about Nell Brinkley. So I immediately emailed her. I answered her. I said, I know about Nell Brinkley. I've written a book on women cartoonists, and she's in my book. And I would love to have your work, but I have the, the collected work, your mother's work. But I have to warn you that as a writer, I am not very rich, and I can't pay a lot. And that's still true, by the way. Um, <laughs> and she said, I wouldn't dream of charging you. I just want this work to go to someone who will appreciate it. And okay, so she could have. We're talking email, which means she could have lived anywhere in the world. But she actually lived about a 30-minute, 20-minute drive from San Francisco, which is where I live. So obviously, there is a goddess of forgotten women cartoonists, and that goddess was at work here. And she drove her mother's collection over, and it was about maybe a foot, a foot worth of, of very, very well put together uh, scrapbooks, not pasted in, but in plastic sleeves, really well put together. And and basically, I have based everything I've done on Nell Brinkley on this this collection as a starting point. And then, of course, I have since collected more. You can find Nell Brinkley pages on eBay. Hmm. Not all the time, but you can find them. And sometimes they're very expensive, but you can find them. How much? Uh, there's a trem- obviously there's a tremendous amount of her work in this book. And it's extremely well organized. How much more of her work is out there? And do you, do you know? Do you think it'll, there'll be another collection? Um, I think I did the best I could. I mean, not every, you know, in these these amazing serialized stories, which is what this book consists of. I don't have every single one, um, but I have enough so that you can read the stories and read the adventures. Um, I don't. Unless someone discovers a hidden cache of Nell Brinkley that was Mm. done before 1918, which I think is unlikely. I do believe that the Golden Eyes series was the first, um, or or something that was done after she retired, uh, because she retired in, like, 1937. Um, And I think, basically, I have the majority... Of of Nell Brinkley, in that book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, why did she draw herself into so many pictures, or am I exaggerating? She did, didn't she? I love yeah. that. Yeah, she personalized her work a lot, and you can recognize the way she she always gave herself that little bump on her nose. She exaggerated the bump because in the photos you don't really see that much of a bump, um, mm. but you know she exaggerated it so that you know it's her. Well, because, you know, the, the black and white, she did the black and white uh, um, strips. Well, they're not really strips. They're really panels. She did those. Those were daily. And mm-hmm. so she just got very personal with her readers. Hmm. Um, is there enough information out there about her? Or do we? is there a whole lot that we just will never know? Well, besides this... Um, this book that just came out, The Brinkley Girls, I have a smaller book, a biography of Nell Brinkley. Uh, oh. that was published by McFarland. Uh, it's all black and white, and I say it's smaller. It came out in 1999, and it is a biography. There is, There are examples of her work in there, but because it's a small-sized book, uh, we couldn't use full pages. There was no room for full pages. So you can really read that book as a companion piece to the Brinkley Girls. The Brinkley Girls will show you all her lush art. The McFarlane book is a biography. And that biography contains really all the information I was able to dig up on Nell, as much of her life as I could put together. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't realize that you had done. That's what I was kind of leading to: is whether biography. Yeah, yeah, that came out in '99. And as I said, it's not an art book; it's a biography, but it's a good companion piece. No, I don't think. uh, My first book was actually published by McFarland back in '92, and I don't think anyone will accuse them of being art book publishers. No, no, they're not. (laughs) Uh, Nice people, but no, that's not their thing. Exactly. Um, uh, You know of. of the things that you show of the serial, serials, uh, I particularly liked uh, Betty and Billy and their love through the ages. I, I, the style of that was 
it seemed like it was it was the most mature scenes and the backgrounds. It was the most detailed of all of her work. That's oh, in the it's book, absolutely I gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's her most romantic, really. Uh, it's not as much of an adventure. Oh, and yet it is. Each picture does tell a story, doesn't it? Um, mm-hmm. What the, the basis of this is Betty and Billy. By the way, she had this funny habit of calling all her women Betty and all her men Billy. Those were like her nicknames for men and women, the Bettys and the Billies. Uh, so Betty and Billy are this this contemporary pair of lovers, and they look through a crystal ball, and they see that in ever since they were, you know, the days of the cavemen, that they were lovers. And in every, in every generation, in every century. So she draws them. She gets to draw them, you know, as, as cave people and as, as Egyptians. And, and in the days of, of um, the, the conquistadors, when he's a conquistador and, and she's a beautiful Aztec princess, you know, and, and, and ancient Greece and, and uh, days of Louis the Sixteenth And this, you know, sometimes it ends well and sometimes it ends badly but they always gamely go on to the next life, the next incarnation. So it's like, and it, it's, it's definitely her most romantic and her lushest. I mean, she loved costumes. She loved mm-hmm. period pieces. So in this one, she gets to draw every period and every <laughs> costume. Now, after that, uh, like towards the late 20s, I guess, early 30s, her art simplified. It was yes. less complicated. It, was that just a, Was that just her getting older? And uh, you know, why did that ha- why did that happen? Because oh, she certainly peaked with the uh, love through the ages. I think so too. But you know, the stuff she did in the twenties, not really the late twenties. I'd say from the 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 middle twenties, um, okay. she was simply changing with the times. I mean, she was a pop person, really a popular person, a popular artist. And so her art style changed, and deco came in. And so it simplified. You can see in some of these uh, very much an influence by, of John Hell Jr., who was the famous flapper artist of the 20s. Um, it still looks absolutely like Nell, and the women are still absolutely gorgeous, but they're flappers. And um, she did an enormous amount then. And actually, this is the closest she came really to comics this whole period in the 20s, when even though there are continued adventures, they're still on the page. There's like at least usually about four or five pictures. And there's no panels or anything, but there's continuity. And mm-hmm. the, um, the words are at the bottom, at the bottom of each picture, which was pretty commonly done in, this, in, the, um, in the Sunday newspapers. I mean, uh, the old Flash Gordon strips were like that, and the old Tarzan strips were like that. Mm. Well, um, uh, Trina, before we uh, we come to the to the end here, I want to talk to you about what else you have coming up. Uh, yeah, you've got uh, two more books, right? You've got one I this do. fall and one in 2010. But I don't know what they are, so tell okay. us. Okay. Okay. Well, the one that's coming out in the fall is called, and and it has nothing to do with comics. Guess what? Nothing to do with comics. It's a history of the golden age of Chinese nightclubs in America. It's called <laughs> really? Forbidden City, the Golden Age of Chinese Nightclubs. And this is something that, like, no one even knew about. I have over 200 photos of beautiful Asian entertainers, gorgeous Asian women in, in evening gowns or, or dancers in fishnet tights or, or absolutely unbearably handsome Asian men with their hair slicked back in tuxedos tap dancing, there was this period from 1937 to 1964, especially in San Francisco's Chinatown, where the Chinese nightclubs flourished, and they were very sophisticated and very dashing and very glamorous. And, you know, if you will ever you go to see the old movies, like the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers movies, there's always nightclub scenes with someone, people, you know, chorus girls, people singing and dancing. And it was just like that. It was terribly glamorous and sophisticated, except all of the entertainers were Asian. Mm. And if you were an Asian and you wanted to sing and dance, these were the only places at this time that you could do it, you know, um, because there was enormous racism. But... Caucasians came to these clubs, in fact, during the 40s. That was the heyday of these clubs, especially in San Francisco. You know, when the GIs were about to be shipped off, they had some R&R time in San Francisco. They would flock to these clubs, to these nightclubs. Um, 
Shall I go on to the next book? Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Well, you're going to love. You're going to love the history of Chinese nightclubs. That's coming out in the fall. Okay, the next book I am still working on, and that that will be out in uh, in 2010, obviously, because I'm still working on it. But I'm almost finished, and it's a new history of superheroines. A rev- you know, I did a history of superheroines in 1996, and that is so out of date, and it's all black and white. This one is being published by Palace Press, who does spectacular full-color coffee table books, and it's all full-color, and it's it's completely revised. I have new superheroines. I've, I've found superheroines from the 40s that I didn't know about before. I have some just gorgeous pictures, and I've just revised a lot of what I wrote and rewritten. Of course, the entire last chapter is rewritten because the entire the last chapter is now. Mm. So that that I'm still working on but almost finished with. Well, I, and that's a good place to wrap up because I, I do have to ask you, uh, on behalf of my daughter, will there be more Go Girl? I hope so. Anne and I want to do more Go Girl. We love Go Girl. And? <laughs> and we want to do more. That's the best I can say yeah. now. I think that if yeah. you want more Go Girl, your daughter and everyone else who really loved Go Girl needs to pester Dark Horse, the publisher, and say, you know, Get off your chair and publish Go Girl. Well, Mike Richardson, I know you're listening to this show all the time, so there I you do. go. Get off your uh, chair <laughs> with it and publish more Go Girl, damn it. Um, <laughs> and, folks, let me tell you, you can order uh, Trina Robbins' latest book, The Brinkley Girls, at great bookstores everywhere or on mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com, or amazon.com. And the same goes for all of her other books. Go ahead. Oh, and I just have to tell you that if you live in the Bay Area, I'm going to be at the Cartoon Art Museum. There's a show, a Brinkley Girls show at the Cartoon Art Museum right now from March 21st to August 23rd. And I, the opening reception is going to be Thursday, May 21st, a book, uh, book release party. I will be there with the books and I will be doing a PowerPoint show and talk on Nell. So oh, that's, that's May. That's Thursday, May 21st, if you live in the well, Bay Area. And well, if tell you do live in the Bay Area, you ought to know yeah. where the Cartoon Art Museum is. I was going to say, tell everybody at the Cartoon Art Museum I said hello. I got to uh, come out there. Uh, hmm, it's been a, two, three, maybe four years now. I, I did a presentation on, uh, on uh, Will Eisner and uh, got to meet oh. very nice people, and it's a great, great little place. Isn't it? It's fabulous. I'm so glad yeah. we have a cartoon art museum. <laughs> well, and uh, folks, uh, I want to remind you that you can also, for more information, I assume, on this, you can go to trinarobbins.com. It's T-R-I-N-A-R-O-B-B-I-N-S.com. It's all solid. And uh, I suspect Trina's probably got information there about that appearance. And I am putting uh, it on books. my blog tomorrow. There you go. Okay, so wait until tomorrow. <laughs> and then go there. Um, Trina, it is always a delight to talk to you. I love your enthusiasm for everything you're working on. And uh, I know that uh, young girls, my daughter included, who have an interest in art, will uh, only benefit from the uh, work and research that you put in to uh, you know, bring light to uh, other women artists uh, through the years. And uh, you know, appreciate that. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Bob, you are fabulous. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. You take care and good luck. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. And folks, for uh, more interviews with uh, comics artists and writers, uh, some men, some women, surf over to our main website at www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my first conversation with uh, lovely Trina Robbins, as well as conversations with uh, Gene Colan, uh, Dave Gibbons, Wendy Peeney, uh, Pete Von Schale, Peter Cooper, uh, Chuck Dixon, Drew Friedman, and many more. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites. Whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Pointer Online, Digital Journal, Podcast Pickle, Vox, Folio, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, or Odeo. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly, bob at andelman.com. That's A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N. 
You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter. That's uh, www.twitter.com slash Andelman. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day to spend it with us. Thanks for listening. Everybody.